on the 24th of November 1999. A large underground cave created by a block caving mining method suddenly collapsed at North Park's mine. The mine was not producing at the time as it was a designated maintenance day and this required more people underground than normal. The cave was very large. It was approximately 160 metres in base diameter and 180 metres high. Within seconds, a huge plug of collapsing rock compressed about 4 million cubic metres of air in the cave. The rapidly and highly compressed air was forced from the cave through several routes. The effects varied across the production level at the base of the cave, but generally there was minor trickling from draw points, heated air, dust, shrieking noises and some air movement. Individuals in some parts of the production level reported ground movement, rock noise, cracking noises, ear popping, reduced visibility and difficulty standing. However, another path for the escaping air was also available. An exploration drive called One Level intersected the cave high above the production level. Pressurised air with entrained rock, debris and other material entered One Level with extreme velocity. Once in One Level, the air pressure, more correctly called an air blast at this point, proceeded toward the decline. Somewhere in One Level, the air blast struck a utility used by the two drillers that had been working in the area. The drillers, Mr. Stuart Osman and Mr. Colin Lloyd-Jones, were hit by the air blast and fatally injured. The air blast travelled further into the decline, encountering another vehicle. This vehicle had two passengers, the manager of mining, Mr. Ross Bodkin, and technical services team leader, Mr. Michael House. The vehicle was picked up by the air blast and tossed around the drive. Both passengers were fatally injured. The air blast finally went up the shaft access decline to the hoisting shaft. The air blast energy moved hoisting skips, damaged guide and head ropes, as well as blowing the shaft collar doors open. Once the gusts of air and materials from the shafts and decline died down, the event was over. This presentation has been developed by North Parks Mine and Rio Tinto using the resources of the Minerals Industry Safety and Health Centre at the University of Queensland. The three modules cover the management of major hazards in the minerals industry, including human factors issues, the events related to the North Parks air blast, and finally, the lessons learned from the event. This presentation covers Module 1, the management of major mining hazards. The module is an overview of the nature of major hazard risk management, also called principal hazard management. Within the major hazard risk management process, there are human factors issues that impact on the quality of decisions made by mining industry management and engineering functions. A number of human factors issues are also outlined using the 1999 mining disaster outlined in Module 2 to illustrate the concepts and derive the lessons learned in Module 3. Hazard is often defined as a source of potential for harm or a specific unwanted situation. Specific to personnel safety, the potential for harm is directly proportional to the nature and magnitude of the energies involved in the work. Mining involves exposure to very large natural and man-made energy sources. These large energy sources have the potential for major damage should they get out of control. Sometimes major hazards are defined as any potential energy or situation that can result in one or more fatalities. This definition may be useful for many sites, but in most mining operations virtually all sources of energy that are required for mining or result from the nature of mining have the potential to kill. Therefore the focus on multiple fatality events may be helpful to differentiate the most severe potentials. This presentation will use the term major hazards in reference to the multiple fatality potential. The most difficult hazards to manage in the minerals industry are those inherent in the nature of the mining environment. For example, in the underground mining environment, there are major hazards related to ground control, 
atmosphere, and in some cases, exposure to materials that may inrush. These three hazards may be more challenging to manage than other major sources of energy in the operation, such as the large equipment and the high voltage electricity. Management of risks from these major hazards must take into account the role of human factors in order to be effective. Inherent mining hazards such as ground control, atmosphere and materials that can inrush are more difficult to manage because in some cases they may be difficult to recognise. Sometimes these type of hazards are difficult to manage because their nature and magnitude is unclear and variable. The history of the global mining industry includes many major catastrophes that illustrate the consequences of major unwanted energy releases. Ground, atmosphere and materials that can inrush are all energy sources. Ground is affected by gravity and stresses. Gases or other chemical energies such as methane, carbon dioxide and others can contaminate the workplace atmosphere. Thinking of hazards in terms of energy helps us find the sources of potential disasters that may occur in all areas of the minerals industry. It's also helpful to recognise that energy is mainly controlled by design. Good design is a result of an effective engineering and management process. The engineering and management process involves decision making throughout the life of a mining operation. The management of major hazards requires a process, often called a major hazard risk management process. It is made up of the following steps. Identify and understand the hazard. In order to effectively manage any hazard, the hazard must be recognised and understood. To recognise a hazard means that people are aware of its presence. To understand a hazard, the following must be understood with reasonable accuracy the magnitude of the hazard, the mechanisms by which it can lead to an unwanted event, and the nature of the potential negative consequences it can cause. There is a basic rule in risk management. The existence, the nature and magnitude and potential consequences of a hazard must be understood in order to establish the risk. In other words, a hazard cannot be managed unless it is understood or appreciated. Establish the risks. There are many ways to measure risk, commonly a combination of event likelihood and consequence. The measurement of risk offers the opportunity to identify unacceptable situations, establish their priority and the need for further controls to reduce risk. Identify controls. The purpose of the identify control step in major hazard risk management is to establish effective methods of reducing unacceptable risk through controls or barriers. Of course, the criticality and design of these barriers is usually based on the perceived risk. If the risk is seen to be very high, the effort to select the most appropriate barrier is also high. If the hazard is not understood or appreciated, then the effort may be incorrect. Other parts of the major hazard risk management process involve the use of feedback loops that ensure previous assessments of risk and control placements are effective and appropriate in the current situation. Monitor status. Keeping an eye on the hazard and related factors is a key aspect of major hazard risk management. This type of monitoring helps to ascertain whether assumptions about the hazard are correct and whether the hazard is changing. Deal with change. Change is a major factor in major hazard risk management. Hazards change, risks change, and controls change. The major hazard risk management process involves making decisions about hazards, risks, and controls for potential catastrophic events throughout the life of the mine. Theory tells us that many significant workplace or work process related risks are assumed in the decisions made or not made in the design or planning process. These decisions are most often made by managers and engineers. Other risks, often related to execution, are assumed at an operational level where different decisions are made. However, 
For many of the major mining disasters that have occurred in the Australian minerals industry, causal factors related to design and planning are key. These issues are related to the process of strategic decision-making. The strategic decision-making process involved in mine design and planning is the focus on this presentation. To look more closely at the quality of mining decisions in the context of recent disasters, it is helpful to consider certain failure modes that appear to impact on strategic decision-making in major hazard risk management. Diana Vaughan is one of the key authors of texts and papers related to the 1986 NASA Challenger disaster. She suggests that organizations make strategic errors due to issues in organizational human factors. Three well-documented organizational human factors issues in strategic decision-making may be significant in the management of major mining hazards. These three areas are comfort with uncertainty, mixed and weak signals, and groupthink. Comfort in uncertainty refers to the natural human tendency for feeling comfort with risk where there is no experience of an unwanted event. Using a vehicle driving example, people may believe they are safe drivers only because they have never had an accident. This assumption may be incorrect. Similarly, in mining, Many of the hazards are natural and inherent in the nature of the industry. They may involve an issue such as ground control, gases or hydrology. Ground-related hazards might be difficult to clearly and fully understand without investigative methods that might make mining uneconomical. Therefore, decisions are made with significant uncertainty. Like the previously mentioned driving example, Site management and engineering decisions may be based on assumptions that the hazards and the risks are understood, despite the fact that significant uncertainty exists. Unsound beliefs are a part of human nature, whether it be specific to driving or mining experience. There is a human tendency to consider events that have never been personally experienced to be unlikely to occur in the future, though we are not certain of the hazard. This type of problem might affect the information gathering phase in strategic decision making. In other words, not enough information is gathered to decrease uncertainty. Diana Vaughan presents the concepts of mixed, missing and weak signals. She suggests that the quality of engineering and management decisions may be compromised by problems with the signals or sources of information that indicate the status of hazards and risks. Mixed signals is a term used to refer to situations where monitoring of a hazard or risk indicates that there is a problem at one point and not a problem at another point. This lack of clear indication also reinforces the human tendency to assume all is well, rather than consider that problems may be occurring when messages indicate both. Missing signals, of course, refers to the absence of useful information to indicate whether a hazard has become an unacceptable risk. Weak signals is used to refer to information that is not reliable, specific or complete enough to provide information that is considered valid by the decision makers. Of course, in all three types of signals issues, potential exists for engineering and management decision making to make incorrect assumptions with all the best of intentions. These types of problems may also affect the information gathering phase in strategic decision making as well as the monitoring phase of major hazard risk management process. The information could be unavailable, unclear or confusing. Groupthink is a well-documented phenomenon that occurs when a group makes decisions. It occurs when a homogeneous, highly cohesive group is so concerned with getting or maintaining agreement that they fail to evaluate alternatives and options. It's important to note that group decision-making is a common part of the engineering and management process of the Australian minerals industry. This type of problem would affect the entire process of strategic decision-making and major hazard risk management process. In other words, all phases could be weak or skewed by groupthink. Ian Janus is a major author of groupthink theory. Janus suggests that there are many causes to undesirable groupthink. 
Four of the most relevant causes in the minerals industry may be homogeneous members, strong directive leadership, group isolation, and group cohesiveness. Janice suggests that groups that include members with similar backgrounds and frames of reference, possibly challenged by unique or new technology issues, may react inappropriately to external pressure. For example, a new mining technology not performing to expectations may lead a site engineering or management group to take an overly optimistic stance in order to take the path of least resistance. If this group is made up of similar thinking individuals, addressing a unique problem, keen to minimize confrontation and overly confident about their grasp of the situation, an inappropriate decision with potential disastrous consequences may be possible. Janice suggests that inappropriate groupthink can be identified by careful examination of group-based decision-making in an organization. He suggests looking for the following symptoms. Overestimation of the group's invulnerability, more colloquially, overconfidence. Increased pressure towards uniformity. Close-mindedness and collective rationalization of decisions. None of these symptoms suggest negligence or deliberate inappropriate decision-making. All four of the suggested symptoms can easily occur in a cohesive, narrowly focused technical group, challenged by external issues and limited in their certainty about the relevant issues and hazards. Janice clearly points out that there are significant consequences to inappropriate groupthink. Are groupthink and human factors issues relevant to some of the major disasters that have occurred in the Australian mining industry? Module 2 will examine one recent disaster that may have implications for mine design and planning, and thereby strategic decision-making processes and their human factors. We would like to thank Rio Tinto and North Parks Mine for their commitment to this presentation. This presentation is dedicated to the victims of the North Parks air blast. The drillers, Mr. Stuart Osman and Mr. Colin Lloyd-Jones. The manager of mining, Mr. Ross Bodkin. And the technical services team leader, Mr. Michael House.